All right, good evening to everyone. Tonight we'll be picking up from chapter six of Shmuel Beis, the second book of Shmuel. And we're continuing with the very exciting rise of David HaMelech. When we last left off, a very significant thing happened. There was an attack from the Plishtim, the Philistines, the main enemy of the Jews. They were constantly antagonizing them. And David had completely smashed them. They sent a wave and then another wave, and David had neutralized the army of the Philistines. And as we mentioned before, this will be the last of the Philistines actively attacking the Jews. They're still going to be around, and we'll hear about them getting attacked, but they're no longer going to be encroaching into our space and attacking us because David squashed them. And that's significant because last week in Shul, on Shabbat, we read Parshat Re'eh, and over there it says, It shall be when Hashem destroys your enemies that surround you and gives you respite, He gives you a, like a break from your enemies, then you shall go up to the place that I designate and make a temple where you will bring your sacrifices. In other words, once the enemies have settled, once you've mowed the lawn, there's nobody there bothering you, then it's time to build the Beit HaMikdash. So David, who also read the Parsha, he was well aware of this. And that's where our uh, Perik Vav, the sixth chapter now tonight, picks up with David taking the steps to build the Beis HaMikdash. He was laser focused on all of his duties as a king. And now that he had settled it with the enemies, the enemies are down. It's now time to go find a resting place for Hashem. So uh, you may recall right now, where was the Mishkan, which was the, I guess, the traveling, uh, the traveling sanctuary where the Jews would bring sacrifices. The the Mishkan was in Givon. It was in a place, a, a different city, not in Yerushalayim. And not only that, the Mishkan didn't have the the centerpiece of the Mishkan is the Aron, the holy ark. That was not in Givon. After the Plishtim had taken the ark, they brought it back, and it's it's currently in a place called Kiryat Yearim. So you have the Mishkan in one place the ark in another place. And now David has just entered Yerushalayim as the king. So this is what he does. In chapter 6, he wants to bring the ark home. He wants to bring it to Yerushalayim, where it will finally be in its permanent resting place in the temple, which David fully intends to build. As far as David knows, it's his job to build the temple, and he's going to succeed in doing that. Now, you and I may be aware of the fact that in the end, David is not the one who builds the temple. Rather, it will be his son Shlomo. But David did not know this, nor did the prophet of his time. So let's dive right into chapter number six with the entrance of the ark to Yerushalayim, or at least what they hope would be. So, Perik Vav Pasuk Al, the first verse, it says, Ve'yosef od David et kol b'chur b'Yisrael shloshim aleph. And David uh, gathered again all of the chosen men of, Yis of Yisrael, 30,000. He says it gathered again, which sounds like there was an original gathering. But the Pasuk, the story starts here. So where was the first gathering? What does that mean? So the truth is, there's another book of Tanakh called Divrei Hayamim, Book of Chronicles. And that book will review many of the events that we're learning about, but it adds more detail. So over there in chapters 13, 15, and 16, if you review the events over there, there's a lot more detail and it fleshes out our story. So what originally happened was David gathered the elders of the Jewish people, the leaders. And he said to them, it's time for us to bring the ark to Yerushalayim. I've established Yerushalayim as the capital. I would like to solidify this as the capital of the Jews. And let's bring in the Aaron HaKodesh, the holy ark. And after he gathered the leaders and got their support, he now makes this second gathering. So it's very interesting. In the book of Shmuel, there's only an allusion to the first gathering, where, and we get the full story from the Divri Hayyam, the book of Chronicles, which was composed later in history. It's interesting. Okay. So, David and all of the people that are with him arise and they go forth to bring up the Aaron. They 
take the ark on a wagon, a brand new wagon, which means they built a new wagon out of like fresh wood. And this wagon would carry the ark, I guess, led by animals, right? Led by oxen. Does this sound familiar? When was the last time you heard of the, of the ark, the Aaron Kodesh, being led by animals on a wagon? And you, that's when a pop quiz. When it came back from the Philistines. Excellent, yes. The two, was it two cows? Very good, yes. They got two, two uh, cows. Then when the Philistines realized we can't handle this ark, it's, it's destroying us, they decided to send it back to the Jewish people with gifts, the golden hemorrhoids, and the, and the, right? And, but the way they sent it back was they got two cows uh, attached to a wagon, and they put the ark on the wagon, and the cows on their own walked back to Israel. Um, so the Jews said, okay, the last time the ark traveled, it was on a, on a wagon, so let's do the same. This was a grave mistake. Throughout this episode, the initial attempt to bring the ark to Yerushalayim, we're going to find a few different mistakes that the Jewish people made, and that's why we'll see very shortly that this was a failed attempt. The Jews failed. They made a, they, they made a fundamental mistake. The ark is not meant to be carried on a wagon, by animals. Hashem gave us very clear instructions how to carry the ark. Anybody who read the Chumash in the book of Amidbar, it says that the ark is carried by the Levites. And they don't even hold it directly. They put it on, it has staves, right? It has long poles. And they put those poles on their shoulders and they carry the ark. Human beings, and not just any human beings, specially designated people, the Levim, who are a tribe designated to care for the holy artifact of the Jews. And here, the Jews were taking after the surrounding nations and they put it on a wagon. That was a fundamental mistake. It showed that they didn't appreciate the, the Kedusha of the Ark fully. And it showed that they weren't looking through the lens of the Torah. They were looking through the lens of the people around them, just like the Philistines did, they did. That's a mistake. So, okay, we're picking up on some issues. Number one is they sent the Ark on, on a Galach on a brand new wagon. They took it out of the house of Avinadav, Asher Bagiva, and it now it lists the individuals who were leading the ark. You know, the animals were pulling it, but these people were like the accompany, accompanying um, uh, individuals that, that led the procession. Uzzah, Achio, the sons of Avinadav. The ark was coming out of the house of Avinadav, and his sons, Uzzah and Achio, were leading it out. Verse number four, Vayiseumi Beit Avinadav, Asher Bagiva, they took it out of his house. Im Aron Ha Elohim. There's a, there's a note here. Uh, just trying to remember what that means. Oh, okay, got it. Uh, no, nothing significant. Okay, Achio was walking before it. And everyone is celebrating. In verse number five, David, Vechol Beit Israel. Significant line. David and the entire house of Israel were celebrating Lifnei Hashem. I just told you the English. They were celebrating before Hashem. The Hebrew is Mesachakim. The way to say happy and joyous is Smechim, that they were happy in front, before Hashem. Here it says Mesachakim. The word Mesachakim also means celebration, but it has the connotation of frivolity and lightheadedness. Frivolity, is that the word? Frivolousness? Basically, they're a little bit lightheaded, a little bit not serious. They lack the proper seriousness in their celebrations. A little bit too wild. Yes? Um, they were making merry. Making merry, yes, very good. Sometimes we'll, right, there are times in the Jewish calendar where we're, we're meant to be happy and, and celebrate big time. Let's say Simchas Torah coming up, be merry, God, God willing, we're about to have the, the celebration with the Torah. That is a very extremely happy time. There's dancing. We do unusual things, things that we wouldn't normally do in a shul. We dance around, we sing. There's a lot of sweating, things that you don't usually experience inside of a shul. And then we have we Bahab have to, just in case we overdid it. What did you say? Then, then we have, we have Bahab in case we overdid it. Excellent, right. The later generations instituted days of fasting in case we didn't do it properly. And there's always a concern. And we, a person always has to check himself. As much as you want to celebrate with a, a certain level of uh, openness and and feel the true simcha there has to be it has to be tempered with reverence 
because you are in a holy place and you're dancing with Sifrei Torah. It's always a balance. So here, the word used, Mesach Hakim, indicates that there was a lack of reverence, a certain lack of reverence. That being said, you see something very special. David v'chol Beit Yisrael. David and all of the Jews together are celebrating. David, in his, in his humility, this was his approach. When it comes to serving God, me and the people are equal. I'm not King David. I'm David, together with all of Bnei Israel, serving and dancing in front of Hashem. Okay, so there's two different things to point, take out of this. Number one is the humility of David, who included himself in the nation. Why? Because we're standing before Hashem, and before Hashem, we're all equal. We're all just as low in front of God. So that's number one, the greatness and humility of David. But number two is the lack of reverence that the Jews were expressing in their simcha. They were doing something good, but it was lacking a bit of seriousness. And they were using instruments. Bechol atzei broshim, wooden instruments. Uvechinorot, uvin valim, uvtufim, uvimina aniim, uvetzel tzalim. It lists here instruments, which we don't even know how to translate. Minan im means moving or shaking instruments. In English, they write timbrels. What is that, like some sort of drum? I don't know what a timbrel is. But the Mepharshim here say it's unclear exactly what this instrument is. And this is another criticism. It's a, they were like freestyle. Timbrel, yeah. A timbrel is like a tambourine. There you go. Okay. Only without the drum part, just like a, so it's just maybe the with the drum part. I'm not sure. Okay. But you, you shake it to, to make the sound come in. So minanaim is that word. These are instruments that we don't find elsewhere. There was actually um, prescribed instruments when you're bringing sacrifices. The Levium use certain instruments that they play. To, to make the music for the sacrifices. Here, the Jews were kind of like freestyling. And they said, hey, anybody's got a guitar, bring it. Yeah, I'll bring my cowbell. I'll bring my... Tr-. People were just playing their own instruments. Again, showing that a little bit of lack of reverence and regard for the Torah's way of celebrating. It's a very interesting thing. Okay. So they come to a place called Goren Nachon. Suddenly, as they approach Goren Nachon, the Mepharshim say, six steps into the journey. They took six steps forward, and suddenly, a shamtu habakar, which means the uh, the oxen got dislodged. They got disconnected from the wagon. So Uzzah saw that the, the arn was going to fall. So he reaches out his hand to support the ark from falling. Vaychar af Hashem be Uzzah. Hashem's wrath came out against Uzzah, and he struck him there, al hashal, because of his blunder. Hashal means like an accident. Vayamot sham imaron elokim. Suddenly, in the midst of the celebrations, in the midst of the merrymaking, Uzas extends his hand to, to support the Aaron, and he's struck dead. So this puts obviously a sudden, a sudden stop to all of the celebrations. Somebody just died, a holy person, Uza, the son of Avinadav, the holy man who had just housed the Aaron. He has, he now is dropped dead. What happened? What happened? Was he a Levite? No, he was not. He was not a Levite. Avinadav's family were not Levian. And that's a significant point. The people who were leading out of the Aaron were not Levian. That's not the way that Hashem designed it. Um, I've put into context the, the, the lackings of this particular celebration, which we now can appreciate why it is that Uzzah is struck dead. First of all, Everyone who was at that celebration knew the history of this special ark. The way the Jewish people entered Eretz Yisrael was through the Jordan River. And if you recall, first the Jordan flowed upward to make a dry path for the, for the Bnei Yisrael to cross over. But then the water came back down, continued to rush, and the Ark of Hashem, which was still on the eastern side, carried the Levium over the rushing water, carried, excuse me, the Kohanim over the rushing water. And the, the Ark carried the Kohanim across the river, miraculously. And as if to say, the Ark does not need people to support it. The Ark takes care of itself. As it did in the land of the enemy, it fought for itself. It carried the Jews into Eretz Yisrael. And Uzzah lacked that awareness. The Ark does not need your support. You just have to keep a safe distance. We're dealing with extremely high voltage. Although he was a holy person, although he had good intentions, 
this is an extremely high voltage scenario. Hashem makes it that everything about the Beit HaMikdash and specifically the Holy of Holies, which is the Aron, um, extremely high consequences for any misstep. The closer you go towards the Kodesh, the greater the sense of awe and the greater the consequences for even the, the most slight offense. For even the most slight offense. Because we're talking about something serious here. There's no room for, for error. So Uzzah extends his hand to support the Ark and he dies. So first of all, he didn't appreciate that the Aron was meant to support him and not the other way around. But also, also this was the expression of justice, which which was criticizing the entire affair. The way they were celebrating was not appropriate. The way they were carrying the iron was not appropriate. And now this was like the the straw that broke the camel's back, or the the straw that broke the ox's leg, is the fact that he extended his hand to support the iron, he's struck dead. Um, what actually happened? Um, I don't see anybody on my screen, so I hope you're all there. Um, it would be nice if I could see some of you, but I understand not everybody can have their camera on, and that's fine. But if, if something's not clear, please feel free to speak out. That's all I mean to say. I want to... Uh... Oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Fox. It is wonderful to behold your presence. <laughs> okay, great. I'm happy to see somebody's out there. So it says here, Shamtu Abakar, that the oxen became dislodged. What does that mean? So the, simp- the, the way Rashi learns it is, they separated from the, from the wagon. So the wagon was now like freestanding. Maybe it was going to topple over, right? Because the oxen, it will will like tilt down. Um, However, in Divrei Hayamim, in the book of Chronicles, when this is recorded, uh, it's more clear that something happened to the oxen themselves, that suddenly they had collapsed. They had lost the ability to walk properly. And as the animals were going to fall over, Uzzah extended his hand to support the ark. Okay, just, just as if like, Hashem made this go wrong. Whether he dislodged the oxen from the wagon or the oxen themselves began uh, to, to, to fall. Hashem gets angry, strikes Uzzah. Verse number eight, Vayichar David al asher parat Hashem peretz be'uzzah. David became exceedingly uh, upset because Hashem had struck down Uzzah. Um, there's a difference between these two verses it's the same Hebrew word, Vayichar. When Hashem, uh, when Hashem got angry at Uzzah, it says Vayichar. And when David got upset, it says Vayichar. But there's a big difference between Vayichar Af, that the wrath of Hashem, Hashem flared up, as opposed to Vayichar David. Uh, Vayichar Af Hashem means Hashem became angry, which means like there's a subject to the anger. He was upset at Uzzah. Vayichar David doesn't mean David is angry at a subject. I mean, it just means he's upset. He's disappointed. He suddenly realized, with the death of Uzzah, he realized we've done something wrong. These things don't happen by chance. The ox fails and Uzzah struck dead. We've done something terribly wrong. So he was upset. It was like a self-reflection. We've done something wrong. He was upset with himself. And I just peeked. I, I, I noticed that's actually how our art scroll inserts. David was upset in brackets with himself because Hashem had inflicted a breach against Uzzah. Right? Where did they get that from? It's from the lack of the word af, uh, from the Hebrew. Okay. So David immediately, in his humility and in his greatness, takes responsibility for what just happened. Vayira David at Hashem bayomahu. David feared Hashem on that day. And he says, how can I bring the ark to me in Jerusalem? I can't bring the ark of Hashem to me. What does that mean? David feared Hashem on that day. David did not fear Hashem until now. Certainly he feared God. Everybody, right? a person of David. What that means is his mode had shifted. He was previously in a mode of uh, being extremely elated and in love and wanting to connect. And now he had switched into the mode of reverence and fear and awe. And he realized that this is not the way to welcome the Ark into Yerushalayim. David, as the king, is the heart of the nation. And he realized we're not at our maximal state right now. Because of this thing that just happened to Uzzah, uh, we, we are not in the right mode to welcome the Ark into Yerushalayim. To the Ark into Yerushalayim. And since it's the very beginning, right, with the laying the foundations for the Beit HaMikdash, everything has to be perfect. So he paused. He paused the ceremony. And after six steps, David diverts the Ark and he says, we're not bringing it to Yerushalayim until we're ready. This is verse number 10. He did not desire to bring the ark to 
the city of David, Yerushalayim, and rather he brings it to the house of a person named Oved Edom the Gittite. Oved Edom Hagiti. Um, Oved Edom. The Gemara, I, I believe in Sota, expounds on his name. The, the name Oved means serves, servant. Oved Edom was a, a righteous person who served God. Edom means red. So it's related to the word Adom, which is red, because it embarrassed David. The disparity between Oved Edom and, and himself. Oved Edom was such a great person that David felt ashamed that he was not on his level at this moment that Oved Edom could house the ark and me, David, I'm not, ca I'm not capable of housing the ark now because my, my current level is not up to par. A fascinating uh, drasha of Chazal. The simple meaning is his name is Oved Edom, but Chazal expanded to, to also talk about the righteousness of Edom and how David felt in comparison to him at this moment. Oh, very nice. Uh, Joy Johnson, welcome. Uh, you asked, is that, uh, is that connected to Esau? Edom is the same as the nation of Esau. In this case, it is not related to, to Esau. It's the same exact word, and it's for the same reason. When Esau came out of the womb, he was very red. But uh, in this case, the redness is not referring to, to the nation of Esau, nor to this color, color of Edom skin, but rather to David's complexion, because he was ashamed of his lack of greatness. Okay. So the ark ends up going to the house of Aved Adom for three months. And the result is in verse number 11, Hashem blesses Oved Adom and his entire household. What the Mepharshim explained, he became exceedingly wealthy in a very short amount of time, three months. His family all started bearing children. Right? Imagine in shul every week, a, a kiddush sponsored by the Oved Adom family because he got a promotion in his job. And my grandkid got engaged. And we had a baby. And etc. So, the abundant blessing was just happening. Um, Vayugad, and the reports came to David of what was happening. Hashem has blessed his household and everything that, that is associated with him because of the ark. So David says, oh, then it must be time to bring the ark up. When David realizes that the ark of Hashem is bringing blessing and he's not striking people down, he realizes that the ark is indeed a source of bracha. And David regrouped. And again, in the book of Chronicles, there's a lot more details here. David regroups. And he says, now it's time to bring the ark to Yerushalayim. Everyone sees that the ark is not a scary, dangerous thing. Everyone sees that the ark is a thing that brings blessing. David knew that, but now it became public knowledge. Right again in shul every week of Edom is announcing a new simcha that they had a new blessing that came to them from the ark. It became very public knowledge that the ark is a source of blessing. We just have to treat it with reverence. So David now celebration 2.0. We're going to take the ark to Yerushalayim, and in the book of Chronicles it says that he gathered the Levites and he told them to put forth specific individuals who will lead the procession because the Torah mandates that the, that the ark be taken by by the Levim. And now David has, has corrected this error. It's not going to be sent on a, on a wagon with animals. So he gathers the Levium. And now they start the party. And look at the way they do it this time. In verse number 13, Every six steps the procession took, they would pause and bring sacrifices. They would slaughter an, an ox. And a Marie is like a fat and ox. Why six steps? Because the first time we tried to bring the ark, after six steps, somebody died. So now we're grateful. Every time we make it through an additional six steps, we're grateful that there has been no mishap and that we have the, the merit of bringing the ark to your shalim. You see a different mode here. It's a mode of reverence and a mode of joy, but with the knowledge uh, that we have to keep things serious and, and and keep our focus. When you're bringing a sacrifice, that's an extremely elaborate process where you're constantly focusing on how to do things right. There's a lot of details in a sacrifice. And also you're focusing on the connection, the bond that it creates. It's an offering which creates connection. So we're staying constantly connected and cognizant of our of, of God. Um, and the word here used is besimcha, with joy, with true happiness, and not with uh, lightheadedness, not merrymaking but the uh, true celebration of 
of holiness and purity. And here now we have the behavior of David the individual. A fascinating episode of David Mechar Ker Bechol Oz in verse number 14. David was dancing with all of his strength, Lifnei Hashem, the David Chagur Efod Bad, and he was wearing a tunic, a linen tunic, not his royal garments, like a regular robe. Once again, David here was displaying that in front of the Ark of Hashem, I'm equal to the rest of the nation. We're all here to serve Hashem. I'm just one of the gang. Once again, David and all of the people of Israel were bringing up the Ark of Hashem, this time using shofarot, which are very common instruments which the Torah prescribes. And the Ark was coming to David. And who was looking through the window? Michal bat Shaul. Michal, the daughter of Shaul, the wife of David. She's watching from the window and she sees her husband's behavior, that he's that he's dancing around and making sporadic movements. And in her heart, she was uh, disgraced. She felt disgrace at David's behavior. She was upset at David's action. And she's going to confront him about this shortly. They bring the ark to Yerushalayim in verse number 17. And they put it in its place, Besoch HaOhel. David specifically built a tent and not a, a house, not a, a strong structure, because he wanted to show that this is only temporary. We're planning on building the base of Mikdash, where there's going to be a more permanent setting for the ark. So therefore, I don't want to give the impression that it's coming into a new place yet. I, he puts up an, uh, an ohel, a tent with, with curtains, rather than a wall made of, of stones and, uh, and a ceiling. And so David finally arrives and David brings sacrifices before God. And when he finishes his sacrifices, he blesses the nation in the name of Hashem Tzavakot, the master of legions. Um, perhaps this name of Hashem is used because David had recently defeated the Plishtim, a definitive victory. Um, so Hashem is the master of the legions, the master of the armies of the Jewish people who were able to overcome the Plishtim, which as we noted, was significant because that is the necessary step before bringing the Arun in. So I think maybe that's why here Hashem is referred to as Hashem Tzavakot. And David does something interesting here. He gives out goodie bags. Yeah, just like on Simchat Torah, he gave out candy bags to the kids. Here, David wanted to make sure that everybody was feeling the simcha, the joy of the Ark coming to Yerushalayim. And so he hands out gifts. What kind of gifts? Food. Chalat lechem ve'eshpar echad. And uh, he, he gives them bread and selections of meat, v'ashisha echad, and pouches of wine. And everybody went home with these gifts. This is a significant thing. Whenever something ha is happening in the spiritual world, when a great thing is happening in the spiritual world, our job as and humans, and specifically as Jews, is to show that in the physical world. That's it. We're here to bridge the, the gap between heaven and earth. So when we want to feel the joy, the spiritual joy, we gladden our bodies. We have a Yom Tov meal. We have a Shabbos meal. We have delicious food to like wake our body up and say, hey, hey, you should wake up and be excited because there's something big happening here. We always want to involve our whole self in the service of Hashem. So since this is a happy occasion, everyone came out to the, to the party. We don't want to leave you to leave empty-handed. You should go home with a lot of meat and good bread and wine. Eshbar, the Radak writes, it's a funny name for meat. Eshbar, uh, what does the art school translate? Portion of beef. Oh, a generous portion of beef. Yes, the, the Radak writes that Eshbar is an acronym for Echad B'Shisha uh, uh, par. It is one-sixth of a cow. They would divide a cow into six portions, that's a lot of meat per portion, and every individual got one-sixth of a cow home. That's a lot of meat, you know? They, they talk, that's a huge gift. That's a huge gift. The king can do that. And he's doing that to show them this is a big deal. Something big is happening. Yeah. So they got a lot of steaks to take home. Mazel tov. Is this word related to Shever from Yosef and his brothers? Mm, no, here it's it's pay, esh par. Oh, okay. As par, yeah. Um, yeah, Shevard, it's interesting. 
I wonder what that word is now. Okay. Everybody returns to their home. Now we're on verse number 20. <laughs> D- David comes back home. By Ashov David Leverech at Beito. The Malbim, the art scroll brings down the Malbim that rather than going to, like, to the after party with the prestigious people where David's going to get praised at his successful uh, party, he goes home to take care of his family. It shows David's humility. He goes back to his family to bless them. He hasn't seen them. He's been out, right, dealing with the transfer. And now he's confronted by his wife, Michal. And right after a great day at work, the husband comes home and he's humbled. Oh, first we have a question. I'm sorry, Mr. Fox, I didn't see. Go ahead. Your hand is up. Yeah. Yes. This every six steps, they slaughtered another cow or ox. Uh, by my calculation, that somewhere is about 2,000 cows. Wow. Um, wow. Um, first of all, that's I love that you made the calculation. I love that. Uh, uh, but secondly, that is... That sounds about right. As well, God willing, we'll get to the the building of the temple, and Shlomo Melech to inaugurate the new temple. He brought thousands of offerings, thousands on one day. Yeah. Um, so, th- so this actually is, it seems to be the the way. Of, that's a lot. Yeah, you're right. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's eight kilometers. It yeah. was the distance they were traveling, eight to ten kilometers. Yeah. And you, I appreciate the the setup that that requires. You know, you have to have herds of cows just traveling along with you, yes. all the animals, and Kohanim at the ready with their knives and everything. It, it must have been a lot of planning. You need a lot of good party planners for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. It just just to bring it out, you know, like for us, it's like two verses. For them, it was it was dozens of hours of planning and preparation and calling all the farmers and making sure everything's ready to go. Thanks for that. Okay. Were there enough people to eat all that meat, or how did they store it? <laughs> There's no such thing as too much food at a Jewish party. <laughs> yeah, especially this it was a very public thing. You're talking about everybody was gathering. Kol Beit Yisrael, all the Jewish people are there. So they've come from from the south to the north. They're all there. So you've got you've got a hundred, hundreds of thousands. They needed all of that. Yeah. yeah, and they could take it back with them. Well, not the sacrifices, but the, yeah. the extra meat. Okay. Um, so David comes back home and Michal now approaches David. Um, this is a, a spiritually great uh, woman. And she chastises her husband. Uh, as I, I heard in Rabbi Fink's uh, Pirkei Avos class on Shabbat, he says, a good friend is the one who will tell you that you've got spinach between your teeth. Yeah, we, we want to know when things are going wrong. We don't just need a bunch of yes men. And here David's wife is doing what a wife does best is pointing out her husband's imperfections and showing him how he should be improving. And she says to him, Israel, what kind, Is this an honorable day? That you've appeared to the servants of your servants like an empty person. At what an honorable day, she says sarc- sarcastically, that the king of Israel it looks like a lowly servant, like like a lowly man in the eyes, not just the servants and the servants of the servants. Yeah, even the servants had servants. And you've degraded yourself in front of them. What kind of dancing were you doing out there? Exposing yourself? The the, the Chazal explained that his flesh was exposed while he, while he was dancing in front of the ark. His robe was moving back and forth and he exposed a little bit more of his body than was regularly revealed. You can imagine, you know, like his shin was showing or something like that. His ankle was showing. Um, and she says that that's not fitting for a king. She I said to him, I, yeah. I remember learning somewhere, I don't remember the source, that it was his arms. Oh, really? Revealed. Okay, interesting. I didn't I see any specifics about it. Okay. Uh, but very interestingly, the, the Gemara inserts here, and you can kind of see it between the lines in his response, that she said to him, all of my days in my father's house, Shaul, right, the first king of Israel, I never saw a bit of his flesh exposed. He was so regal and so, and always had such awe and reverence of God, never exposed a bit of his flesh in the presence of others. You're talking about, you know, like a wrist, an ankle, completely covered because you're the king. And 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 this is what you're doing in, in front of everybody? That's what she says to him. Like, my father was a better king than you. He knew how to treat the position with respect. 
So David says to Michal in verse number 21, Lifnei Hashem, um, Asher bachar bi navich umikol beito. Hashem has chosen me over your father. That's what he says to her. And he's made me the leader uh, uh, over his nation. V'sichakti lifnei Hashem. And I was rejoicing before God. What is he saying to her? I'm the king, not your, not your dad. And God chose me, I win. What he means to say is, your father and I had two different approaches to our position. Shaul wanted to impress upon people the regalness and the honor of the position of king. I want to impress upon people the way we should behave before God is completely humble ourselves. Two different approaches. Even if it means humbling myself as the king, I'll do that because I want to show people how to serve God. I'll go amongst them and I'll humble myself before God. Two different approaches. And he's saying to Michal, your father was, was a tzaddik. He was righteous. And he, David mourned heavily when Shaul died. But his approach was not the one that God chose. God has chosen me because apparently this is the right approach, to humble yourself consistently before God. And he says, I was not dancing before people. I was dancing before God. I don't care who's watching, and I don't care what they think of me. As long as I realize that I'm doing the right thing, to show true joy and simcha over the Aaron of Hashem coming to Yerushalayim, if there's a true reason to be happy and dancing, then I will do it, and I don't care, even if the lowly people misunderstand it. That's, that's what he's responding to. Hashem has chosen my path over your father's. And then he says to her very significantly, Unkaloti odmizot. I would become even more humbly. I'll, I'll, I'll lower myself even more than this. And I'll be lowly in my eyes. Um, um, and among the main, maid servants who you spoke, yeah, those servants of the servants that you said, in front of them, I'll be honored. It's an honor for me to be dancing before God, not the opposite. Yes, and that's why you'll, you'll go to to yeshivas on uh, Simcha's Torah, which we mentioned before, and you'll see the the Rosh Yeshivas, the 70-year-old, 60-year-old like leaders of the whole institution, dancing, dancing like young children, like young children, because they, we're giving honor to God. It's not about my own prestige where I have to stay, you know, like and walk slowly. We're giving honor to God. We can lower ourselves even more. This line, Kaloti Odmizot, Rabbi Tatz, I, I heard years ago from him, and it struck deep that Michal was saying to David, you can't show everything. A person always has to leave something covered. It's not appropriate to put it all on the table and just completely ex expose your inner self. There always has to be a part of yourself that's just between you and God and, and nobody knows about. Here you've shown everything. Like you've shown everybody the depths of your, of your passion. You've shown it all. And David's response to her was, you, you don't, you're not aware of my level. There's even more than this that I haven't shown. When Kaloti owed me that, I did leave something hidden. You didn't realize you know, how deep of a well I, I can draw from. I have such passion and such love for Hashem. You thought I put it on the table, all on the table. As low and as, as passionate as I was externally, there was even more than that that I was still holding back. Uh, such a powerful exchange between two, the two of them. And now the, the verse ends and says, Michal, and then number 23, Michal was punished for her critique of David because she misunderstood what he was doing and she got it wrong and she critiqued him for, no, for not. Her punishment, very tragically, was that she did not have a child until the day of her death. What the Mepharshim say here is, until now she had had children, but at this point she stopped bearing children until the day of her death. On the day of her death, she did have a child, but she died in childbirth. That's what it means. So she would no longer bear children during her lifetime. But on the day of her death, she would actually she gave birth and, and then passed away because of her critique of David, her, her, her righteous husband. Very fascinating. So here we have a, a brief recap. The Ark of Hashem was taken to Yerushalayim. The first attempt was failed because there was not enough. It wasn't being treated properly. It wasn't done in the way that Hashem had designed. The Levim weren't carrying the ark. There was too much lightheadedness. David regrouped, and he did it again a second time. After realizing what Hashem had signaled, he had the Levim bring it up. He did it with a little bit more reverence. They brought sacrifices, and David showed 
what it means to be a true servant of Hashem is to dance passionately and don't be concerned for your own honor in the place of Hashem's honor. Um, Michal criticizes him and she's punished for it. Okay, that is that. A little bit longer today. I hope that's okay. I, wasn't, I didn't mean to be overbearing. just wanted to get through the chapter. Thank you so much for, for joining me. And I look forward to learning with you next week. Next week. All right.